honor to be here with you today. Uh, I am the official global Latino president of the Jack Graham Fan Club. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Y'all happen to have the best pastor on the planet and growing up and following Pastor Graham and now getting to know him as a friend, it's a privilege indeed. So love you, my friend, honor you. And Ronnie Floyd is here, another friend of mine and, and of course, coach, wow. And in Israel, we were together. And we were jet lagged when we got there. And, and I'm not gonna, because of this ethical commitment, I was a board of director for Promise Keeper, spoke for PK for so many years. So integrity and righteousness is everything. So I won't disclose any confidential information. But there is a possibility that Coach and I cuddled. <laughs> it's all under the blood of Jesus. Now, <laughs> I wanna get right into what God placed in my heart because we're living in some serious times. Talking about manning up, boy, do we ever need to man up, coach. What a challenge indeed. Because we, Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. We truly live in difficult times, in darkened times. It's not a coincidence the first time the universe hears the words of God, God's voice. It was not to say, let there be joy, peace, or even love. The voice of the sovereign, the glorious, uttered the following Genesis 1-3, let there be light. God always begins by turning the lights on. Life requires light. Faith requires light. To a great degree, metaphorically and prophetically speaking, we live in a Genesis 1-2 moment. And darkness prevailed upon the face of the deep. Because we do live in dark times. Turn on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, and even Univision. I'm contractually obligated to say Univision. And, uh, <laughs> We do live in dark times. And some have stated in the past couple of years that we live in the darkest hour, darkened by sin, immorality, moral relativism, spiritual apathy, cultural decadence, infanticide, pornography, poverty, violence, false prophets, watered down preaching, hypocrisy, unbridled consumerism, voyeurism, secular tyranny, terror, discord, division, strife, hatred, jealousy, and unbelief. We live in dark times. What's the antidote? Matthew chapter 5. You, 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 men that men up. We, the men that men up. We, you, are the light of the world. And a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, men, let your light shine before all men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Man up. Here's the title. Man up. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Man up. Man up and be light by who you are. Let's exit the scripture here. You are the light of the world. The city on a hill cannot be hidden. Who are we? We cannot man up and be light until we understand who we truly are. And there is a battle for identity. It is the quintessential query stemming from the existential womb. Who are we? We can't be light until we repudiate every single vestige of identity moratorium. What defines you? What makes you a man? And boy, is masculinity or manhood under attack. Under attack. Who are we? That there's so much fluidity. Who are we? What defines you? Are you defined by your past? Are you defined by your circumstances? Are you defined by what others say about you? Are you defined by a hashtag? Here's the great news from what took place on the cross. Christ defines you. You are not defined by what surrounds you. You are defined by God's spirit inside of you. You are not defined by your circumstance. You're defined by his covenant. You're not defined by the hell you're going through. You're defined by the heaven you're going to. You're not defined by your failures. You're defined by his forgiveness. You're not defined by the like, 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 by the likes of many. You're defined by the love of one. You're not even defined to all the religious folk. You're not even defined by what you do for God. You're defined by what God already did for you. It's the cross, the empty tomb. His word defines you. You're defined by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. By Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. That's what defines us. And there is a collective attempt, and it's not conspiracy theory. 
There is an attempt to define us by culture, by society. So it behooves us to ask, who are we collectively? When we man up and we are certain of who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us, then we can re repudiate every single vestige of identity fluidity. What does that mean? There's an attempt to define us even collectively as the ecclesia, as a church. Who are we as Christ followers? Who are we as men of God? Who are we? Are we just another institution in society? Are we another religious faith narrative competing in the marketplace of ideas? Are we a feel-good apparatus for the spiritually impaired? Even recently on a talk show host, speaking again for ethical purposes, we're not going to mention the name, The View. So recently, when even our Christianity is somehow labeled under the nomenclature and descriptor of mental illness, we really need to, we need to man up and know who we are as a church. Are we an antiquated conduit of irrelevant values no longer applicable in a world of Facebook, iPad, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube? How we respond, how men, how Christ-following men respond will determine whether or not if in this generation, light will once again overcome darkness. So who are we? We must respond with clarity, conviction, and courage the following. We are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill. We are people of the word. We are salt and light. We are prophetic and not pathetic. We are disciples, witnesses, and Christ followers. We are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We are children of the cross, fruit of the empty tomb, and product of the upper room. We are the redeemed of the Lord, the sheep of his pasture. We are forgiven, free, and favored, called, and chosen. Yes, we are warriors and worshipers. We are world changers and history makers. Let me tell you what we are not. We are, that's what people, that's certain, in the, they don't, they, they, don't, they don't really get it because we're not Google and we're not Microsoft and we're not Ford and we're not Starbucks and we're not even the NFL. We are the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell will never prevail against us. We are the light of the world. And we need to understand we can man up and be liked by who we are, which means that we as men, we are first and foremost not black, white, yellow, or brown, Hispanic, charismatic, or automatic. <laughs> we are above all born again, children of God, men that always remember that God does not call the perfect, he calls the willing. He doesn't call the one that has it all, he calls upon those that are willing to surrender it all. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Man up. Man up and be light by removing the obstacles. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and hide it. If you have it, you don't hide it, you let it shine. Our challenge as men is to remove the bowl of apathy, complacency, acquiescence, and fear. And once again lay claim to the stand of righteousness so that we may shine before all men. And we can't be lied until we embrace the following. One, today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Second, there is no such animal as comfortable Christianity. Third, you are what you tolerate. Fourth, moral stagnation will always lead to spiritual atrophy. And finally, truth, truth, truth. H.B. talked about truth. Truth must never be sacrificed on the altar of political, cultural, or sexual expediency. And there is an attempt to hide the light. There's a battle to hide the light. It's a spiritual battle indeed. And it's not Harry Potter or Hogwarts. Via the conduit of biblical metaphors and illusions, we know very well there are real spirits trying to turn off the light today. The spirit of Pharaoh is alive holding people captive in the Egypt of bondage and fear. The spirit of Goliath still lives, mocking and intimidating the children of God. The spirit of Jezebel makes men and women hide in caves with sexual perversions and manipulation. The spirit of Absalom is dividing homes, churches, and relationships, while the spirit of Herod is killing the young through abortion, violence, poverty, sex trafficking, murdering infant dreams and visions. Yet the most powerful spirit on the planet is not listed above. We, men, we have to man up and declare and understand 
and the most powerful spirit alive today in me and in my family as we pursue righteousness, as we adhere to the word of God, committed to the centrality of Christ in biblical orthodoxy, biblical truth, the most powerful spirit, don't drink the Kool-Aid, man. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. This cynical mentality and worldview, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Regardless of what we see on television, read in the paper, regardless of the postings on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, the most powerful spirit alive today is not the spirit of Pharaoh, Saul, Absalom, Goliath, or Herod. The most powerful spirit alive today is still the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And where that spirit is present, there is freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17, there is power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What does this mean, Pastor Sam? What does that really mean? Man, when we understand that in these dark times, when we know who we are, when we know and acknowledge the fact that there is a spiritual battle to turn off the light of righteousness and truth and grace and love, when we understand this, and then we don't walk with a cynical, sort of pessimistic worldview, because we understand that for every Pharaoh, there must be a Moses. For every Goliath, there must be a David. For every Nebuchadnezzar that rises up, there must be a Daniel. For every Jezebel and Elijah, for every Herod, it, there must be a Jesus. And for every devil that rises up against you, there is a mightier God that stands up for you. And it's time. It's time to remove the bow. It's time to shake off whatever hell or life has placed upon your light, always remembering that what you can't shake off, Jesus washes off. Remembering that you're here, not because you perfectly held on to God, but because God perfectly held on to you. You're here not because your faith is so efficient. We are here because his grace is always sufficient. We are here because we learn that when life throws us rocks, we build altars. First John 2, 8, I am writing you a new command. This truth is seen in him and you. The darkness is passing. The true light is already shining. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of God has risen upon you. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. So man up, man up and be light by where you stand. Not only by knowing who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you, by acknowledging the fact that there is a constant battle to hinder and hamper and obstruct your light, but be, you can man up and be light by where you stand. Where do we stand? The stand represents the facilitative platform on which we shine the light of Christ. Where do we stand? We stand on the unshakable reality that Christ is the hope of glory. We stand on John 14, 6. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We stand on that reality. And to stand on that reality right now is a bit precarious. It's difficult, but nevertheless, it is our mandate. If you can put the photo up here for a second. This, this is not self-serving. It took place. I understand it was God-ordained, a God appointment indeed. I'm just a kid from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And there's no way a kid from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania would ever have been behind that podium if not 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Exclusively via the conduit of the grace of God. But it's where we stand. Where do we stand? When I received the phone call, Right, what is it, uh, right after the inauguration, right after the election, uh, a month and a half before the inauguration, actually two months, right about after Thanksgiving, my wife and I were driving from San Francisco over to Sacramento, and the phone came via the conduit of Bluetooth in our vehicle. And the phone call was pretty interesting. Reverend Rodriguez, yes, we're calling you from the Senate Inaugural Committee, the Presidential Inaugural Committee. We're inviting you. The President would like you to participate in his inauguration. What do you say? And, and my response is, I am humbled, I'm honored, but I have to speak to my executive committee. Can I get back to you? My executive committee, by the way, in full disclosure, is my wife and my three kids. So can I get back to you? Absolutely. So I, I put the phone down, and, or I hung up the Bluetooth, and my wife looked at me and said, so what are you looking at me for? And I went, well, you know, I mean, it's just because, and 
because my, in full disclosure, we pastor a, a beautiful church in Sacramento. It's very multi-ethnically diverse. If you would come to our church in any given moment, you would have no idea what's the majority group at all. It would be difficult for you to identify the majority group. So because of that, the election became an interesting thing. And, and so, I, so I looked at my wife and went like, so what? And she went, you know, when this is something God has promised, there was a, you're, don't even, there's no need to ask. And I went, well, let's just, let's just, okay. So right before Christmas, I got the call. And Reverend Rodriguez, have you made up your mind yet? And, I, and this, this is my conversation. I went, well, I, I'm inclined, but in other, so I, I participated in other inaugurations, but not at this level. There are inaugural services like beforehand and other activities that take place. And on other occasions, I'm privy to the fact that in that other, other groups would give you the script. So in other inaugurations, things were scripted. So I asked, will you, will you dictate what I will read or pray and will you censor it? Is this something, and, and I'm not, I understand that they do it on purpose to make sure nothing comes out that is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I get that. But it's, I, I'm, I'm privy to the fact that other inaugurations, things were scripted. So I asked, will you tell me what to pray? I kid you not. The response was this. Whoa, whoa. They interrupted me. said, whoa, whoa, whoa. No. Hey, stop. Pastor Rodriguez, we're inviting you because on that day, we want you to share whatever the Spirit tells you to share. And I went, Wow. So we, we, right beforehand, a reporter from a certain magazine whose name this definitely I will not mention, but you will, you will recognize it. The reporter asked, so, so Pastor Sam, you're praying. Yes, ma'am. And how are you going to wrap up your prayer? And I went, what do you mean? You know what I mean. What do you mean? You know. What do you mean? And I knew, by the way. How are you going to wrap up the prayer? What do you mean? You know what I mean. Will you mention that name? Like if it was like a disease. And I went like, let's see. So we, we came up and the, the, uh, the Catholic Cardinal prayed first and, and then I came up and, 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 and I gave part of what I just shared here and read from this passage and I wrapped up and, but because I had a man up because for a long time, a certain name wasn't mentioned on that podium. It was Mucho Tiempo, since that name was mentioned from that podium. So I had a man up knowing where I stand. And I looked at the cameras, 1.1 billion people all around the world, the presidents behind me, as you well know, Supreme Court here, and Congress here. And I looked at the cameras, and I wrapped up and I said, respectfully, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. I kid you not, you look at it, YouTube, right behind me, you heard the, 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 the you know, and they said, amen. And over here they said amen. In full disclosure, I did not hear the Supreme Court say amen. But <laughs> those behind me said amen. The president said amen. In front of me, amen. So post facto, Reverend Rodriguez, were you trying? So I was the first one. Then Franklin came and Paula. And then afterwards, everybody said Jesus. Even for the next few weeks, even atheists were calling out Jesus. So because it was just, it was cool. So, but it was, it was just, so they asked me, were you trying to be controversial? Absolutely not. Were, were you trying? to be offensive? Absolutely not. Were you trying to stir things up? Absolutely yes. But you weren't trying to be controversial. No. And you were trying to be offensive. No. So, but you were trying to stir things up. Yes. What do you mean by that? And I, and I, and I stated explicitly. Why? Because I mean, it may be part of my theological polity or worldview, but I just don't believe that's just any name. I, I had a response to the reporter and say, that's not just any name. It is the name above every single other name. It is the name to which every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. It is the name of my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, and there is no other name like that name. And believe it or not, America,
America, there is still power in the name of Jesus, and Jesus is still Lord, and he reigns supreme over absolutely everything. There is power in that name. So I manned up, and I declared, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was my mandate. It was my call. And my children were watching, and my kids were watching. And I wanted them to know that dad, that dad would man up, and he would not be silenced by political correctness. That he will not sacrifice truth on the altar of political or cultural expediency. Because I had a man up and declared the sovereignty of a risen Christ. Man up, man up and be light by where you stand on that name, on the centrality of Christ. Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and Christ coming back again. Be light by what you do. In the same way, let your light shine before men and they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Ephesians 5, 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, men. Men up and be light by what you do. Our actions, not just our rhetoric, but our actions. It's, it's our actions. There has to be a continuum a continuum of not just the things that come out of our mouths, but what we do in the private place, how we treat our children, our spouses. Be light. Man up. We shine. We shine the brightest when we understand that Christianity is less about promoting the perfect and more about blessing the broken. We push darkness aside when we recognize that every single person in and out of the womb carries the image of God. We magnify the light when we realize, men, that a divided church will never heal a broken nation, that we are not called to tolerate, we are called to love. We shine the brightest when we understand that the only agenda that can possibly save America respectfully is not the agenda of the donkey or the elephant, but the agenda of the lamb, Jesus. So when I'm asked, what do Christians do? What do you, Rodriguez, you're so archaic, you still believe in this thing about Christian men rising up and transforming a nation. I do. What do, Christians, what do Christian men do besides going to church on Sunday? We love, we forgive, we bless our enemies, we walk in integrity, we quench the thirsty, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, we take care of the widow and the orphan, we preach the word in and out of season. We worship in spirit and truth. We do justice, we love mercy, we walk humbly before God. We are light. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never overcome it. John 1:59. 1 Samuel 3, 3. The lamp of God has not gone out yet. My father and my grandfather stood committed to manning up and being light. I'm a kid from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. My dad was a Mack truck worker, retired. Uh, my, a Calvinistic work ethic growing up in Bethlehem, went to Penn State, graduated from Kutztown University of Pennsylvania, did my graduate work at a school called Lehigh University. You all never heard of Lehigh University. That's Lehigh Iacocca School, by the way, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. In that process, my grandfather and my father would combine a prayer, and they would pray for me, and they would just say, they would lay hands on me, and they would say, Lord, cover him with the blood, protect him from all evil, fulfill your purpose in his life. That was it. Cover him with the blood, protect him from all evil, fulfill your purpose in his life. Grew up, grew up, grew up, just hearing that, that, that wording upon me. Cover him, two men, my grandfather and my father. Cover him with the blood, protect him from all evil, fulfill your purpose in his life. Man, that's cool when you're growing up, but when, when they continue, they, my dad would drop me off and pray for me as he dropped me off at school. When, I, when you're in high school and, and there's a man right there who wants to put his hands on your shoulder, it's not cool anymore. And my, my dad is a native of Puerto Rico, so he's Latin. And my dad, Latin people, they kiss. Forget about hugging, coach. They kiss. <laughs> so back, back in the day, I'm an 80s kid. There was a program called Miami Vice, and I, I, I thought I was, Sonny, I, was, I was Don Johnson, Sonny Crockett. And I would go to school. My dad got me a gift. My, true story, he got me a gift. His gift for me was a 1978 Z28 Camaro, dark blue. Eagle GT tires, hydraulic shocks, tinted windows. I put so much armor all in that car, I went through the driver's side, passenger side, kept on going all the ways I slid it. <laughs> and I went, I went, I one day, a dad gave me the keys. Dad, boom, dad, you're the best dad in the world. My, oh man, you got, you work hard. You're, and you got, this is your gift to your son. 
and, and I'm the only boy. So, Dad, I'm going I'm to drive this to school. I am so grateful for it. He looks at me and says, put the keys away, son. You ain't driving yourself to school today. Why not? I'm going to drop you off until I can't drop you off anymore. I'm going, oh, praise be God. <laughs> Drops me off. Lord, cover him with the blood. Protect him from all evil. Fulfill your purpose in his life. I found myself years later, Senator Friss's office in the Senate, found myself speaking during the Bush administration, going to the White House, going, how in the world did I get here? There were two men in my life, my grandfather and my father, who would pray for me, who manned up, who turned on the light and believed Cover him with the blood, protect him from all evil, fulfill your purpose in his life. I went, wow, that's what, that's, that's what it is to be a man, a man of light, a man of truth. Not perfect, but understanding the grace-filled work of Jesus. So by the way, it's, it's generational, it's a disease, it's a virus, because I have three kids. And when they were going to school, guess what I would do? Before you get out of the car, Lord, cover them with the blood, protect them from all evil, fulfill your purpose in their lives. And believe it or not, it's just my, my Spaniard genes. I'm a, I'm a grandfather already. And I have two grandkids, three and two, Liam and Landy. And guess what I pray for them? I look at my two boys right now. Lord, cover them with the blood. Protect them from all evil. Fulfill your purpose in their lives. Because I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe that when men rise up in the name of Jesus, all things are possible. So... Preston Wood, man up. Man up, rise up and be light. Be light and walk like Enoch. Be light, believe like Abraham. Be light, stretch like Moses. Be light, shout like Joshua. Fight like Gideon. Be light, pray like Daniel. Build like Nehemiah. Preach like Peter. Serve like Stephen. Be light and live like Jesus. Be light and change the world. Because every single time, light stands next to darkness. Light always wins. God bless you. God keep you. Thank you.